first video in the series presented logic as a language, a formal language that can help us think about human language and individual languages. Now that we've seen why it's useful to have a logic that's a formal system with constant symbols and variable symbols, I want to explore the parts of statements and the constants and variables used to represent those parts, parts of statements in logic. So we'll start by dividing all statements we could make into subjects and predicates. So far I presented words and statements as symbols, and used even simpler alphabetic symbols to stand for those words and statements, like X and P. Now when our symbols name something or focus on a topic, they're called subjects. All of the individual constants we've used so far, like H for house and E for the English language, can be used as subjects. But subjects are part of a larger frame. The frame includes the predicate, which relates information about the subject or subjects. If you went through my intro to the verb and its arguments, uh, especially the first two videos on arguments and valency, you've, have, uh, you've got a linguistic perspective on subjects and predicates. You saw that verbs take arguments and the verb and its arguments form the core of a sentence frame. But you don't need to be a linguist to get a feel for the difference between subjects and predicates, and you don't need to take it all the way back to Aristotle's heavy discussion on the topic. You just need to consider the two terms in relation. The rough idea is that a subject is a term that a predicate says something about, and a predicate is a term that says something about a subject. Let's look at those predicates. If a predicate says something about a subject, it makes sense that a predicate does not include the subject. Some examples of predicates are is read, is a language, or sees. Let's simplify these predicates by using constant symbols. Unlike uh, variables x, y, and z, and individual constants like h and e, the symbols for predicates are capital letters. Using capital letters for predicate constants is a convention in logic, so the predicates end up looking like this. Our first two predicates say something about a single subject. For example, we could say that English is a language. Then we could write English is a language in logic. That third predicate has multiple arguments. We could say, John sees Mary, or Jill sees the movie, and we'll write the sentence in symbolic logic like this. Notice that the predicate comes first. This is true when the predicate constant is the predicate of a single individual, or when it's the predicate of multiple individuals. Notice that we used constants for our predicates, and that holds true for all predicates in basic logic, but let's scrap our individual constants for a moment and speak a bit more generally about using variables with our predicates. Instead of speaking specifically about English as a language, we might want to find out whether or not something is a language. In this case, we'll use X to stand for that something. I mentioned it in the last lesson, but it's worth repeating for clarity's sake that that variable X can be filled by many values, but it doesn't stand for any specific value. A fancy way of saying this is a variable ranges over the domain of discourse, where the domain or the universe of discourse is just a set of everything that the variable can represent. So when it comes to is a language, you can think of this combination of predicate and variable as blank is a language, and this one as blank is running, and this one as you guessed it, blank sees blank. More precisely, blank sees some other blank. Of course, if you have strong analytic skills, you can always think in terms of the variables instead. X is a language, X is running, and X sees Y. With variables in mind, let's look at the valency of our predicates. This refers to the number of terms that a predicate says something about. The predicate is a language and is running say something about one term which we can symbolize with the variable x. So they have a valence of 1. The predicate c's, on the other hand, leaves two slots open for us, one for x and another for y, so it has a valence of 2. But let's not stop there. The deceptively short predicate gave has a place for a giver, x, a thing given, y, and a givee, or a recipient, z. So the valence is 3. We can even turn to these variables themselves, x, y, and z, and view them as terms with zero valence. If you're familiar with mathematics or computer science, you'll see similarities between these concepts and the concepts of function and argument or subroutines and parameters. The specialized applications of those terms have been refined from logic. Now let's back up for a moment and consider something I mentioned in the first logic video. 
Whole logical statements may be represented just by the symbols P and Q. This gives you options. You won't always need to drill down to the level of individual predicates, and this may even be a, a better option if you're evaluating statements as a whole. Okay, now you've gotten a bit of a handle on subjects and predicates in logic. So here are some ordinary language statements to translate into logic. So, you've seen the symbols that stand for words and statements, you understand constants and variables, and now you know something about subjects and predicates. But this is all amateur stuff, it's time to move on and look at quantifiers and bound variables which will really tighten up your logical statements.